So good morning, everyone uh, in person and on screen. Uh, thanks for starting so prompt. Um, moving straight into the agenda. Uh, apologies. Yeah, Chair, we have apologies from Malcolm Payton, board member. Mark McAteer, mm -hmm. Director of Strategic Planning, Performance and Communications, and Pat Kenny from Deloitte. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and we have next item, consideration of items to be taken in private. We've got the, the, the minutes from the last private session and associated action log. We've got an update on the investigation report uh, to the trauma and smoke detectors and an update on the Scottish Border Service Level Agreement. I feel content that these are taken in private. Is there anything else that anyone believes they should be taking in private that's currently marked? Okay, thank you for that. Chair, sorry, can I just yeah, one just point of accuracy if it's okay on the agenda um, and from the investigation report. It's trauma bag as opposed to trauma bags. I know that we won't keep on saying it's plural, but there is only one bag. No. Yes, and it is indeed just one bag. <laughs> but it's smoke detectors. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, John. Um and then that takes us into the minutes of the, the last meeting, the 28th of June. Can I check, first of all, whether if you agree these are uh, accurate record of them? Yeah. yeah. And secondly, are there any matters in the minutes which you consider to be matters arising that are not covered elsewhere in the agenda? Okay, so deal with these as an accurate record. Thank you for that. And then to the action log, Kevin. Yep. So the action log um, contains 11 actions. A total of nine of these have been completed. The committee are content for the completed actions to be removed from the action log. There is two actions in progress, both of which will be covered um, during the committee meeting today. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Are we content um, at that summary? Yeah, okay. There's just one point uh, that I wanted just to provide a little more further background, and that's 13.1.5, and that relates to the workshop that we had with ARAC members and committee chairs uh, on the 16th of August, where, where we talked really about from a from a non-exec perspective, um, is is the information that we're receiving the format of it and its contents um, giving us what what we needed to exercise kind of scrutiny, uh, and we had a good discussion and the, the, there were four specific points that came out of that discussion which uh, are, are now being uh, looked at and kind of further worked up. And David Johnson is taking the, the, the lead on that. And just in summary, uh, those four points were to try and improve the currency of the information on the risk register, so reduce the kind of lag between getting it updated and getting it reported to committees. Um, thinking about changing the, the, the presentation, the structure of it, so as to align <laughs> strategic risks two strategic objectives in a way that's that's much clearer. Um, further comments were made about the importance of the narrative that goes on the kind of front part of the risk register. And I know we had kind of moved away from that in favour of a, of a more tabular approach, but I think in the, in the transition we've lost a bit of the benefit of having a wee bit of a story round about that. Um, and the, the fourth point was just making sure that any sort of refinement, and, I, and it is refinement, I mean, it's not tearing things up and throwing them out, any refinement uh, is consistent with the work that I think Richard is leading around a revised combined performance and risk reporting, so that that's all tied together. So, so these were the, 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 the four points. Um, and I'm sure we will come back to these sort of in due course. Okay, thank you very much for that. 
And then into the substantive part of the agenda, and we've got a short, succinct procurement report, John. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, present the annual procurement report for 21-22 for recommendation to the board. Um, I recognise it is a lengthy document, um, and the, but the format of the report is, is both prescriptive in the sense that it has to comply with Scottish Government guidance and the legislation. Um, I would also highlight that uh, as a service, um, it's in line with best practice. Um, and in particular, you, you may recall that as part of our procurement strategies, we said that we would make sure that we were fully transparent and, and all the information around our procurement activity. So this is trying to address that, that requirement as well. Um, there's a number of detailed appendices uh, which have been included, uh, which probably exceeds where we, we are in terms of other public bodies. Um, but I think that should be welcomed, although I do take the point about the 92 pages. And um, so uh, there we go. In terms of uh, rather than me going through uh, individually each of the 92 pages, I thought I should <laughs> I thought I should perhaps give you a summary of the highlights of the annual procurement report. Um, and uh, I shall do so. So at 3.2, we undertook 45 regulated uh, uh, procurements. Um, and the overall value of that is £186 million. Uh, a substantial element of that is obviously to do with the hard FM contracts. So before you say, how come we spent £186 million? Um, that's contracts over the, the, the period of time, so not just within one particular year. Um, the work that we have uh, undertaken uh, with the Supplier Development Programme has also been highlighted in the report. Um, on hard FM, and um, <coughs> just to note that we've been shortlisted for a, an award um, and a, around that work. 85% of our procurement activity is delivered via collaborative contracts, um, which is um, slightly better than the previous. Um, and we've also had a, a slight increase uh, in expenditure with um, small medium enterprises, 33%. Uh, um, uh, and also in terms of Scottish based mm -hmm. businesses, and we have we have spent a uh, forty six million pounds, which is about forty seven point two five percent. We've also made a significant commitment to climate change through our procurement activity, and that can be referenced through the low carbon appliance um, and the work that we are doing in terms of capital management and decarbonising our activities, and, and that's been done through separate ring fenced uh, funding from Scottish government. Um, Plus, we're actually doing uh, a fair bit of work around uh, improving uh, literacy in, in terms of climate change across the organisation. Uh, the procurement team have actually went through that training um, and we are looking to, to try and broaden that training uh, across the organisation. We also can demonstrate our commitment to fair working practices uh, within the report. You have also uh, undertaken a project bank account um, for that little building that you see over there, um, which uh, the benefit of that is that um, subcontractors get paid early. Um, so at the same time as you're paying the main contractor, you then pay the subcontractors, and that improves cash flow. And again, that's something that's been encouraged by Scottish Government, and that this will be the third project that we've undertaken using project bank accounts. Um, the community benefits are highlighted for McDonald Road and Port Lethen um, and also the West Arc. Um, there has been a, a slight reduction in the known contract spend from 6.4% to 5.4%, so that's an improvement. Um, although I would say it's an area that I still feel that we need to, 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 to improve further. Um, we have uh, 17 non-competitive uh, competitive tenders um, and the expenditure in that area was £237,000. Um, just to compare it to, to previously, uh, there was 14 and it was £211,000. So we're broadly similar uh, in terms of NCAs. Again, another area that we could perhaps look to, to improve going forward. Um, however, even when we compare ourselves to, to other public bodies, um, we're actually uh, sitting in a favourable position. Um, the only other one that actually reports is the prison service, and they're sitting at about three hundred or thousand pounds of comparator. So we're broadly doing okay in, in terms of NCEs. 
but I would still always look to, to try and improve in that area. Um, and that's where I want to, to finish, if that's OK, Chair, and, and open it up for any kind of specific questions or thoughts. Thanks, John. Thanks. Um, questions? Uh, Valley? Yeah, I, I won't be surprising minds about Section 4. Um, it's always around the community benefits. Uh, there were two questions. One is, how are we doing in terms of leveraging in the community benefits clauses within contracts to support our responsibilities around corporate parentings and community justice, areas where we have a statutory responsibility already? Um, you know, for example, I know that there are construction contractors that specifically will recruit individuals who have criminal histories or people who have been through the care system. Um, are we encouraging that type of activity? And if we show how are we doing it? And the other one that I'm conscious of, um, the NHS boards have been looking at a little bit more to areas outside the central belt. And I think it's particularly pertinent given that we're a national organisation. How confident are we that community benefits are being experienced across Scotland and not purely within the large urban areas, i.e. the central belt? Which won't be a shock, I'm asking that question too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to tackle the last one yeah. first, if that's okay. Uh, so in terms of how are we making sure that we're getting community benefits and that they're shared across uh, nationally, um, I guess that depends on the projects themselves. Um, so we work at Port Lytham um, up in the north, so we are able to, to therefore get community benefits associated with that. And, and I guess each of the projects in themselves are, are, are unique in some respects. Um, you know, so as an example, um, you would perhaps anticipate community benefit in terms of um, sharing information with schools if you're actually at a project where you're you know miles away from from, from a school etc and um, so the actual program in terms of sort of the definition of how we identify the community benefits is is defined both by the actual framework itself so typically we're going through the escape framework so there is a defined list of here are the community benefits that we should we should uh, include um, and also the type of project that it is. Um, so that probably comes back to your first point, which is are we incorporating the, the corporate parenting? And I would have to, my, my instinct tells me we're probably not doing as much um, because when I've looked through the community benefits, I've not seen no. direct uh, linkage, which is probably why you've then asked that question. So the only thing I can, and I can suggest is that we go back and we make sure that when we're looking at these um, scape frameworks and others that we are then making sure that we incorporate that element into the overall requirement in terms of community benefit. I think the only other thing that I would say around community benefits is that we are, uh, we do try and maximise those community benefits. Um, there is always the thought process of are, are we are we getting more than we perhaps would normally have anticipated? Um, in other words, would we get them anyway? Um, my only thought process is that you, the old adage, you get what you measure, um, and we have defined these particular uh, areas, identified them, so therefore we are receiving um, additional benefits uh, across uh, the communities uh, because of the work that we're doing in that area. Is that answer I know it doesn't completely answer the point because I, I think there is an absence there in terms of the corporate parenting but I'm happy that we yeah. take that on board and, and look to try and incorporate that within frameworks. It, it does answer John if, if I may go through I, I think I mentioned this possibly the last time this came up as well it is a tricky situation and I'm aware of that NHS have been looking at potentially creating registers where communities can create wish list type things that contractors can then actually go to and say, so Robertson's, for example, I think most of them in Scotland, as far as I understand. But what they're able to do is to take a community benefit if they're working at a national organisation or national contract and actually say, well, that, con that commu our community wants this, that community wants this, we can do these things, potentially at very little cost. If the NHS is working on that framework for a community wish list, is there opportunities for us to take advantage of elements of that if it's working? I'm not saying I know that it's working or not. Um, but I think it's important that where we're realising community benefit that we try to make sure that that reach goes beyond the immediate vicinity of a physical piece of work um, if, we, if we are a national service. And I do think that we need to be very mindful of how we leverage and change against our statutory responsibilities through opportunities like this as well. But you've agreed with me. 
Okay, so you can thank Leslie. <clears throat> Thanks, Brian. Um, Mary, you, you made some excellent points there. Um, I had a couple of questions on community benefits uh, as well. Um, my, uh, but, but I think what I just want to do is just to reinforce uh, Vary's challenge, really. Um, what, what kind of made me stop and think about this area was a couple of things. Firstly, just the, the differences in the community benefits between McDonald Road and Port Lesson and how they were presented. And that just made me wonder about how much would have, would have happened without us asking for community benefits. You've picked up that point, John. But the, second point, the second point that made me pause in this area was the Sodexo list of here's all the things we've done for community benefits. And some of these things like, you know, we recruited new security officers. And you think, well, that's not a community benefit. And we had a gift presentation for a cleaner who was leaving. So I've picked you know, a couple of extreme examples, but it did make me wonder about whether we were uh, really critically kind of challenging ourselves and our suppliers on community benefits. Uh, Mary's made the point uh, very well indeed, but I, I would uh, welcome at some point in some forum, perhaps uh, a, a look at what we're doing there. Uh, I think that um, a huge amount of our uh, respect um, and um, respect that we get from within communities is because we are such a community organisation. And the work that has been done by the procurement team in improving all aspects of procurement has been fantastic. And I wonder whether uh, the procurement team in collaboration with our local communities and our uh, LSOs and group commanders and so on can really just give a bit of um, welly in this area and really take our work up a level in this area. Uh, so that was my, my point there. Uh, no particular response required unless uh, John wants to. Uh, Chair, I had a second uh, point on procurement. Can I come in with that now? Yeah, of course. Yeah, OK, thank you. It was uh, normally I think we get the PCIP assessment, and I just wondered uh, what the position was with that. Thanks. OK, um, so uh, I'll start off with the SEDEC, so just as, as a wee bit for a response, because um, I guess uh, one of the things is that, that SEDEC is an organisation, they are quite progressive in terms of the environmental sustainability uh, agenda. Um, and they recognise that that is now a, a very much a requirement in, in doing business with public sector bodies. I, I think one of the things that we make sure that we challenge them on is it isn't just a generality, but it's something that they are doing across the board. And um, we ask them specifically to say, well, look, what is that mean? What is that doing for us for this particular contract? So how can you demonstrate that you are delivering additional benefits to us? on this contract. So sometimes that's probably, Leslie, why they're going into a wee bit more detail, but we've got this extra security and all this kind of thing. It's it's trying to demonstrate additional benefits specific to the contract. So, because I think the tendency is to just have that generality that, that you know, that they say, oh, well, across the board, we're doing something. So we are trying to target them to say, no, what are the specifics that you're delivering against the contract? Um, and I think that's to be welcomed. Um, uh, so and, and, and so hopefully what we are reporting is stuff that we can evidence against this particular contract. Um, in terms of the PSIP uh, process, uh, we undertook the PSIP process back in 2019. Um, we are we achieved the highest band rating uh, in terms of PSIP, uh, and we had a score of 81%. Um, so we are comparable with our central government uh, bodies uh, in terms of the procurement process. We all aim to be in that top top uh, banding bracket, um, and we have achieved that. Um, our next assessment is in August 23, um, when they will review us again. Now they've removed the bar. And every time you do the assessment, so you, you're, you know, what you're measured on uh, changes. And so we cannot guarantee that somehow we will improve on the 81%, pr primarily because they move the goalposts. Um, but that's the, the, the process in, in terms of PSIP. So hopefully that, that answers your question, Leslie. It does. Thanks very much. And great to see progress on the other areas. The supplier perform payment performance is absolutely fantastic. 
um, and uh, the non-contract spend. Good to see that edging down. So, so much is, is excellent here, John. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Anything to watch? Oh, yes, if you don't mind. Um, I love this report, actually. I, I, I love it when it comes every year because uh, I'm one of those sad sort of people that really enjoys this type of stuff. I, I'm, and there's just, I, I suppose, a couple of, of observations and one question. One observation is there's, a, there's probably a good reason why it reaches the length of a Russian model. Uh, there, there, there's a fair bit of repetition in there. Uh, there's only so many times I need to know that 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 our new electric fire appliance can go from Dundee to Dunbar on the eighty. What is really interesting is could it go from Peebles to Port Leith on forty seven percent charge? I mean, that, that's that's the key question it seems to me. But um, I like the way that we are making progress on using SMEs. That that's a subject a topic very close to my heart, and I'm pleased to see that we are continuing our um, rapid payment services, very, very important uh, factors uh, when working with other businesses. I suppose my, my key questions uh, are, um, have we ever thought about doing a GVA state gross value add? Because I think that would be hard economic information that would be quite interesting to look at um, and might yield some quite impressive uh, results in terms of how effective that spend has been in hard numbers rather than some of the more qualitative things. And I suppose my final comment would be, um, whilst I, I hear everything that, that Murray and, and um, my esteemed colleagues say on these, these matters, I would caution against creating too many hurdles for SMEs to engage with the service. So if you impose too many requirements on them, you can actually make it difficult for small firms to, to bid and, and compete. So that would just be my only cautionary. These are requiring contracts over a million and they're only a statutory requirement. Mm -hmm. And I, I have strong views on those as well, but yeah, I, I particularly like the SME engagement, so that's why I would want to make sure that we carry on down that path. So, yeah, um, um, sorry. Can, your question is, is it really about the gross value add? Thing? Yes, gross things. Yeah, thank you. And um, because I, I guess pick up the point around the uh, SME, what could they be, um, what we've demonstrated in terms of that engagement through the supply development program on the hard FM, and there was quite a lot of good uh, results in that, and the SME uptake was actually significant. So it shows if you do that engagement process mm. early do get the benefits coming through yeah. and, and those suppliers are, are very much suppliers within the Scotch base that we would not have been able to, to get involved or it wouldn't have been involved as far as uh, Robertson's are concerned unless we had went through that, that, that programme. In terms of gross value add, um, I, 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 well one, I, I think something we would have to perhaps get some guidance from yourself as to exactly what we are looking for in terms of that gross value add. I know that it's something that they typically do more down south in terms of the kind of social value element to yeah, it, yeah. and it's not something that we necessarily are required to do. Here. No, no, I wasn't suggesting you, you have to do it, it was whether we yeah, considered but, it. Right. And, and therefore it then becomes how, how can you then demonstrate and measure that mm. uh, and what is the kind of methodology that you would apply to, to see, well, this is how the additional value that we've created. So it's certainly something to, to, to explore. Um, I just would have some concerns around that, that measurement and, mm -hmm. and how we could then put that forward in terms of impact. Doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be looking at it, and um, because I think your point, or the first of your point, is right. How can we demonstrate what additional value as a public body is doing that across the, the, the economy uh, and, and across Scotland? I think that's what you're saying. Well, it's one of the requirements placed on the service in terms of how it how it impacts economically. And, and uh, impacts the economy of Scotland, which is sometimes quite difficult to it's demonstrate, but that might be a good way to yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that, Tim. I think that's, that's a, a good point. Um, apologies, in, in my haste to get into the agenda, I, thought I forgot to inquire whether there are any declarations of interest. So retrospectively, can I ask if there are any declarations of interest? And and obviously for the minute, uh, Debbie, it, it will appear as if I did ask that question at the appropriate time. <laughs> uh, so th thanks, thanks for that, um, and, and thanks John for, for that report. I 
mean, it is lengthy, but, but there's a lot of good content. And uh, um, just a couple of things uh, from me. Uh, paragraph 3.4 on the cover paper, it talks about savings of 1.8 million uh, being achieved through the use of Scottish Government frameworks. But the sentence above that talks about collaborative contracts with Scottish Government, Scotland Excel, Crown Commercial Services, NFCC. Is that 1.8 million just for Scottish Government frameworks or is it across? It's, a, it's, it's pulling up what we have in terms of all kind of frameworks, not just right. in the Scottish Government context. I actually clarified that because I anticipated a, a, a question around that area. Right. Um, uh, because you, you see it's slightly less than what it was in, 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 the, in the previous year. So mm -hmm. I've actually asked um, the, the procurement team to look at that in a bit more depth because I'm not sure if we've perhaps underreported mm -hmm. that, that saving because yeah. um, it seems uh, I would have anticipated that we would have a, <coughs> at least similar to, 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 to the previous year. So there's some further work being done in yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously in the context of the resource spending review, okay. but it's it's clearly an area where perhaps paper-based reporting of savings takes on a slightly sharper edge to it. And there is no doubt that there are real savings that can be had through the procurement process. Yeah, but, uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, and uh, you, you touched upon it. Two, two things that I was just going to mention, um, not to make any particular deal about them, but non-contract spend, yes, it is moving in the right direction, but it's been moving in the right direction for a while now. What is the end point in, in this? And I accept that maybe getting to 100% is not realistic, but, but what is a realistic goal and, and when will we get there? Yeah, and I think the only way of, of answering that is actually that analysis of that non-contract spend and actually saying, well, look, is that something that we are ever going to achieve to, to become uh, non-contract? And there will always be that that natural um, transition, if you like, from, from either, you know, we put a new contract in, um, it starts tomorrow, um, and suddenly the old contract is then deemed non-contract spend, so there'll be a kind of transitional period in these things. So I do anticipate that we will always have some element of, of non-contract spend. Um, I still feel that where we're sitting at the moment, based on my understanding of, of the areas of non-contract spend, there is still uh, quite a, a, quite a significant amount of work that we could undertake um, to, to get us uh, to, to a lower percentage. So I wouldn't like to say, oh, well, I'm aiming for 2% or I'm aiming for, for, for yeah. 3%. I would rather say I understand the areas of non-contract spend, um, and those are the areas that we're targeting each year to try and uh, to, to improve on. It really is dependent on the resources across the organisation, and that, that's the typical challenge. You've got that balance between trying to make sure that you're delivering all of that activity for the organisation, but you're also target that, that non-contract spend area. Um, so um, I don't know if that answers the question, it probably explains where I am. <laughs> yes, kind of, because I mean, my understanding is that a part, possibly a large part of the issue of non-contract spend is to do with legacy arrangements. And you would assume that legacy arrangements well over a period of time erode and, and you'll be then in a position where you can go through the proper procurement process. So that aspect of it surely is kind of time limited. But connected to that, it, it and, and this is really what the legacy situation is, uh, is about people not following kind of central policy on these things. And I guess that would be more troubling if we are still unable to control, and I'm not suggesting we can't, but if we were unable to control what is happening at a local level, you know, so is is there a problem about making people aware that the, there are procurement processes that they need to adhere to, that they're just not doing it, or uh, how, how would you sort of explain that situation? Yeah, I wouldn't say that, that people are unaware of the procurement processes, um, because I believe they are aware of the procurement processes. Um, I, I think there is uh, a, a, there's a natural um, uh, thought process of, of 
well, I use supplier ABC and I'll continue to, to use supplier ABC. So there's a bit around us making sure from a procurement point of view that we're communicating mm -hmm. uh, those, those changes to contracts um, and the information is delivered to, to the end user. Um, Yes, there may be some resistance, but I, I don't I don't see that as a as a as a as a huge issue for, for the service, if, if I'm being honest, Brian. Yeah. Um, because we, we do basically say, I'm sorry, you're gonna to have to do use the, the new contract. Mm -hmm. That that's just the position yeah. that we And is the is there a hard control, John, that physically would prevent someone going locally and just saying to Jimmy down the road? Yeah, so so we have a a, a our finance system is a national system and all our suppliers are on that system so we can effectively block that supplier so, so if somebody says well look i've got an invoice and i need it paid we can effectively say well that's fine we'll pay that invoice but we're now uh, blocking that supplier right for, 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 and, and that's work that we, we undertake within procurement right thank you and the last point is about non-competitive actions um, i think it's dangerous to compare the the, the amount of money in your case, the police service, 300,000, therefore we are good. Um, it was prison service, sorry. Uh, prison service, my, my apology. Um, uh, clearly, there's always reasons for this, and it was just to, to get some assurance that the process for approving non-competitive actions is as rigorous as it should be. Yeah. So, um, just to explain the, the, the process, uh, any NCA has to be signed off by myself, um, and it also has to, to go through the review um, by the procurement manager. So the procurement manager um, initially looks at it, sees, look, is there enough information to uh, merit this going through as a, a non-competitive uh, tender? It's, um, and I do have to say that we reject quite a, quite a few yeah. of those NCA's requests <laughs> um, because we can demonstrate, no, you just have to compete the, the, the process. Um, and only once we are satisfied, it will it be presented to myself to say, look, we're comfortable that there is an NCA here. We're comfortable uh, with what the, the, the end user's needs are or the services needs are, um, and that's what then is, is authorised. Um, I have to say I'm getting a bit tougher as well yeah. on, on those NCAs, um, particularly if I see that it's a, a repeated NCA, so in other words, a year-on-year -year, uh, position. So if I can see a, a trend, say, well, wait a minute, you put an NCA last year. In fact, you put an NCA for the last two or three years, so no, I'm not signing off the NCA. I want this competed, and I think that's the right thing to do for the service. Um, but we have to also make sure we are maintaining the overall service delivery. So it may be in the context of saying, "I'll let it go this time," but next year I want to make sure that that's now as part of a competitive process. Okay, no, great. Thanks, thanks, John, and congratulations for being shortlisted for the, the Go Awards. Um, no further questions. Um, we're invited to recommend that this annual report is uh, approved by the board, presumably at its next meeting. So are we content to do that? Yes, we are. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. That then takes us on to the, the chunk uh, around internal audit. And we have four separate papers uh, on this, the, the first being the internal audit progress report. Gary, are, are you taking this? Um, yes, Chair, uh, I'm taking this. Um, I'll just talk you through the progress report. It, it's telling you that the internal audit plan is on track. So you have two reports on your agenda today on revenue and funding maximisation and post pandemic review. There are um, two reports uh, in, in planning around capital investment strategy and workforce planning. And you can see the scopes are included in the progress update for you to review and comment on today. Um, and the only other um, uh, part of the report to comment on is around KPI status, where we are highlighting um, highlighting one KPI as AMBER, and that's around the number of days really to complete some of the audits. And I have to really thank, I think, the officers within the fire service who have been supporting internal audit during a difficult time in the past three months so it's been holiday season there's been changes in the senior leadership team we've had the queen's funeral there's been a lot going on within the fire service and officers have uh, um, uh, gone the extra mile really to support internal audit to get the reports 
cleared for you today for the meeting, but that explains why that's recorded as amber um, uh, within our progress report. Have to take any questions on any of that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gary. Uh, so firstly, on the progress report that's before you, which includes the um, outline uh, terms of reference for corporate performance management and training assignments. Barry. One small observation and one small comment, I suppose, and, and it, in part is actually just seeking reassurance and under the training one that we will be taking account of the learning and the changes that were made within the context of COVID and how those lessons have been learnt in terms of developing the training context, because I'm conscious from the people committee that we've actually seen some very positive change, but it'd be useful to understand that that's going to be looked at within this. And then the second point is I, I agree and understand why this is looking at training specifically in relation to operational staff, but I am raising and I have raised it within people committee as well that we do need to make sure that we understand that there are still training competencies and currencies within support staff as well. And currently there is not an avenue for assurance provision around that side of things. I am aware that Andy is aware of that and that we are working on it, but I, I do think that we just need to be conscious that this is not spoken in all staff and into the very specific is there. So if that was an observation, but the point about the COVID training is possibly one just about the assurance carry. Um, yeah, so we, you actually have a post pandemic um, uh, review uh, on the agenda, but yes, I mean, that's a simple one to do because uh, it, it, um, the service has really good records of its learning from uh, from the pandemic, including learning from training. So we can easily incorporate that to test in a little bit more detail that, uh, that that's clearly flowing through into training plans and so on. I suppose it's specifically how training has modified its delivery as opposed mm -hmm. to the lessons learned, just kind of the same thing. But yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyone want to comment on that? No, I, I think it's a great point and it shows the, um, the crossover between different levels of audit activity. What was looked at within the post pandemic review from a training perspective, is probably more allowed about recovery plans. But I think Barry's point regarding the way that we deliver training now from the lessons learned is a, is a valuable thing to take in, in that particular order. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's that's an excellent point. And, and actually, it's an example where, you know, we can really squeeze maximum value of these audits by just thinking a little bit more broadly about what might achieve. So I think that's a good example of that. And in terms of your point, Barry, this is about uniform rather than support and that there's no channel of assurance. I mean, that obviously goes beyond the, the, the scope of this review, but it is, is that something through the People Committee that you're, you're we are, tackling? And we have spoken to Andy, he's very much aware of it, and as is Liz, and I think actually to be fair to Richards, we are aware of it. But I think in terms of that assurance pathway, it is something that's just worth flagging. Mm -hmm. um, to, to be honest, because especially in the context that in the fire framework, it's where I get muddled about words, but within the fire framework, there is that assurance need around trauma training, which goes beyond the operational side of it being mm -hmm. broader. We still don't actually have a pathway potentially for that to be covered through either, as far as I understand. So there's, there's work in progress, I guess, is what we're saying. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, which crosses over, Richard, to your assurance mapping. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, there would be a need but no source on your map as of today. Excellent. Maybe, yeah. 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 Maybe, well, maybe, yes. Uh, other questions? Because we've got to end up. Oh, Leslie, sorry, I couldn't see that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, I've got a point on the training uh, one and also on the performance management one. On the training one, uh, there is a risk to the organisation where uh, we've put in place a uh, training for everyone and if that training has not been completed and something happens and then there's the, there could be comeback on the organisation that leads us potentially into financial loss. So my question is will you look at training record keeping uh, within the organisation so is the organisation able to categorically say firefighter A, B, C, D, E, F 
have completed that training. Therefore, the organisation did all it could to prevent situation X, Y, Z happening. Thanks. Leslie, that's uh, it's captured in bullet point three, but whether or not, uh, you, you know, the fact you've asked that question maybe indicates that the language we've used um, doesn't address it in the way that you've raised the question. Our intention around completion rates is to say exactly that, that there is monitoring um, around who has undertaken training uh, and that the organisation can evidence that that training has indeed occurred and that can happen at the individual level. Uh, that's really helpful and yes I did wonder whether it was in that bullet point but thank you for confirming that uh, and then the follow-on question to for that would be and what action is taken to ensure 100 percent as close as you can get it allowing for long-term sick leave and so on 100 percent uh, coverage of the trainings required so is that something that will be looked at as well yes yeah, so the the areas are around completion rates and how that's monitored and you would expect part of the monitoring to be for those who have not completed what the arrangements are to monitor that they do in fact complete. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Brian, can I go on to the second point about performance management? Yeah, please do. Yeah. OK, uh, welcome this uh, review and I'm looking at the um, how you're going to consider the that there's an appropriate range of indicators so there's a number of frameworks that you can use to do that there's the five aspects of best value there's the four results aspects of efqm uh, there's, so there's a range of frameworks are, are you using a good practice framework to assess the dimensions of the the, the pis um yeah that, that's my question so one of our first questions as part of the audit will be how does the organisation itself systematise performance so that it can confirm to itself that it is appropriately monitoring the key performance indicators that tell you whether the corporate plan is on track, on time, on budget, the operational plans are being delivered. It's that pyramid of assurances. And as you say, there are numerous models, balanced scorecard, COSO models, um, uh, EFQM that you mentioned, there are a whole host of models that the organisation could use. And the question is, it, 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 does it have that type of model? And if it doesn't have that type of model, how else does it ensure that pyramid of assurances around performance management and monitoring occurs? Uh, and we'll look at that in detail. So then we'll look at what does the organisation monitor and why? Uh, and we'll ask questions around that. That's the intention of this is to come back with um, recommendations that should help the service think about how it develops performance management in the round and to give assurance also back to the board then about uh, whether th the performance management that does exist can be relied upon. OK, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, Tim? Uh, yeah, I, uh, Leslie's uh, excellent point about tracking uh, training was one that I was going to ask about, so I'm glad got that clarified. I suppose that if we were going to do a drains up on on training, I note that we're not going to be covering specialist training. And I was just wondering why that's specifically been excluded. It seems an odd thing to leave out when you're looking at training generally. So I wonder what the rationale was for not including it. Um, well, um, officers may well comment on this, but but. It, it, Part of it is really we could cover where do you stop on training because there are so many different elements of it. Specialist training has been subject to um, a, an ongoing review by the training team. So we felt that the the best route for internal audit assurance at this point in time, so it will be a timing issue, eventually we'll get around to specialist training, was to look at the area that we thought we could add the most value. And that will leak into training in other areas. So some of the learning hopefully from the internal audit review will support um, uh, more wider corporate learning, including in specialist training and in other areas. So that's the rationale for doing that. Um, it, there will be a future audit, no doubt, around specialist training and around corporate training, which has already been uh, raised in the dis discussion. I don't know if uh, officers have any comment on uh, uh, on that point. Yeah, I, Robert. Yeah, now, just an interesting point, I think, for uh, colleagues to note that the Welsh HMI, so my equivalent in Wales, last week published a report on training uh, and the need for a proper training needs analysis across the three services in Wales. Um, so I'm considering that at the moment in terms of the detail within it. 
but it's not about having specialist training and core training. It's about having the appropriate training for each particular place yeah. and the assets and the equipment within each particular place. So carrying out that forensic um, analysis or training need and the time required associated with that need, I think is an interesting point. And whilst we are not cited or planning on carrying out a thematic on training at any time soon, it may be something we revisit in the future. And it's certainly something we will consider during our service delivery area inspections under the banner of people. I think it's something that we would consider not just for the uniform staff, but also for support staff and how their training needs are being met to keep them safe when they respond or carry out their functions in the organisation. So it's something that we are certainly cited on, but it's not, I don't think about categorising it as core and specialist. It's about the actual required training to allow the firefighters and other staff to do their jobs appropriately. Yeah. I, I, I would I would agree with, with, with all of that because um, I, I think the danger is that we look at this in a bit of a silo. So uh, rather than saying, as you've kind of articulated, Robert, that, that what is really important is understanding operationally what is needed and how training is used to support that. And I think that there is a danger if you do it kind of piecemeal. And it comes back again, Richard, to that. Mm -hmm. what, what assurance do we, you know, we have an operational requirement of X. In order to get to X, we need training as, as a key enabler to, you know. So, you know, we may have a report, for example, on, on this aspect of training that says actually we're doing really quite well. But we are significantly in deficit. Around, I'm not saying we are, but significantly in deficit. And the impact of, of the deficit and specialist training, you know, um, is, is the thing that's actually critical to successfully meeting the operational uh, capability and capacity of the organisation. So I, I wonder, even though um, this is excluding specialist training, you know, are we able to, in, in summarising, the conclusions of this refer to and, and relate to what has already been done or is about to be done on specialist training. So to give that kind of joined up approach. Um, can I? Yeah, please do. I, I do understand why they have been separated and I wonder if there's value in reflecting a little bit on what Gary was saying, that the team themselves are looking at the specialist stuff at the moment and, and that I would question whether it's the right time to audit that right now. And I wonder if there's a value, rather than perceiving them as distinct audits, Gary's already indicated, but whether or not we would see this audit and then one around specialist training and then one potentially around the, the corporate side of training or the, the sports staff training as a as a whole piece. And, and part of the reason is that it's simply about practicalities as well, Brian. I think there's an element whereby to go into sufficient depth that I would like to see in this audit around this, do they do they have sufficient time to do that justice and consider all the other aspects? I'm not disagreeing with you, but I, I'm I'm actually content with the approach that's being proposed. Yeah. Um, if that is a yeah. very interesting piece. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and well it is obviously of interest and, and it's absolutely valid. I, I mean but what I, what I want to stress is that uh, the assurance round about training or on the anything else doesn't necessarily have to come from internal audit you know so if there's internal work being done to provide assurance you know and whatever the timing of that is whether it can be sort of referred to in this final report or whether at a later stage the dots can be joined together but but it's about turning things around and the starting point is actually what is it we need what is the assurance that we need that what we need is being delivered and, and looking at it through that end of the telescope, Richard. Well, it's, it's the conversations that we've introduced in terms of uh, on that particular aspect. You could see then where an assurance statement from the executive on that issue would be very useful mm -hmm. in terms of here is an audit on a particular aspect, but we can give you further assurance or give you an understanding of where we're looking for assurance ourselves in terms of the other aspects. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so just list, listening to the discussion there, and um, I mean, certainly in internal audit, we we do really understand that training is 
it, you know, it doesn't start and stop in one area and it, you know, it does affect all parts of the organization. Um, I do think, um, you know, I still think having spent a lot of time discussing this with the service that this is the right approach at this time. Uh, one of the control objectives within that is the, how the organization goes about identifying training needs. And that could be wider because it it, it it could leak into other parts of the business. Um, I, and, you know, I'm sure we can we can signal to um, to the committee, you know, if we think there are there are wider concerns around identification of training needs, for example, if, if the committee felt that were necessary. But I wouldn't want to extend the scope at this point, particularly beyond what the organisation could support reasonably at this time. Yeah. And, and I certainly wasn't suggesting we do extend the, the scope. Um, I, I think it's it's been a helpful discussion, which which actually leads me into the, the benefit of having these outline um, assignment plans brought to the committee. Um, that's the good news. The, the, the less good news is this piece of work actually commenced on the 3rd of October, 10 days ago. So the opportunity for this conversation to influence those terms of reference um, is is kind of all but lost. So it, it's really just to say going forward, if we find ourselves in this situation because of timing that this is going to arrive after the event, as it were, could we maybe circulate this by correspondence so that you have, you know, the opportunity for the committee to to have some input to it. Um, but I'm sure that that can be achieved. Okay. Um, no further questions or comments. So uh, thanks, Gary. That, that's that's been really helpful. Um, so moving on to the two reports is uh, are you it for these as well, Gary? Yeah, so I'm I'm doing all, I'm doing all of the internal audit reports today, Chair. Hopefully, hopefully that's OK with you. Um, so this is the revenue maximisation uh, and funding maximisation report. And um, I'm just going to assume that the report's been read and I'll take questions at the end, but just to highlight or draw out some, uh, some key issues. So we found that the organisation has generally good arrangements for um, uh, for controls around revenue um, revenue streams and, uh, and for maximising those, particularly around government grants, wherever they could do that. The issue that we found, and, and I'm paraphrasing lots of issues within the report here, is how the organisation draws um, uh, the the diverse activity that's happening in different parts of the organisation together to ensure more corporate control and thinking around uh, revenue maximisation activities. And that would include things like option appraisal and um, uh, which areas to focus on uh, more and um, setting targets that are reasonable for maximisation activities and you can see that coming through in um, the controls assessments where three controls are rated as amber and it's all around how the organization monitors and manages at a corporate level uh, all of the activities that are ongoing around this area and within the areas for improvement uh, which are around oversight of, of funding opportunities and centralization of those uh, they need to exercise um, how you identify funds that are available and then how you draw all of that together. Um, and you can see that uh, the management responses to the uh, recommendations from internal audit in each of those areas. Happy to take any questions on any aspect of the report, Chair. OK, thanks, Gary. Uh, questions? Oh, well, actually, before questions, sorry. Um, John, this is you, you're the, the kind of um, recipient of this um, the thoughts on the report. Um, so generally, um, first of all, I would, I would, I would highlight the, the, the positive good practice that they identified uh, as part of this. I would always want to do that first of all. Um, I guess but my overall view is um, we are very much accepting the, the recommendations from, from um, as it's, I think, that point around uh, oversight um, around having uh, additional scrutiny and, and also particularly around a kind of central repository um, is absolutely valid. And I think, you know, we have a, it's a fairly, it's a very complicated landscape um, in terms of trying to maximise funding. So we're trying to maximise it at both the local level um, through the, the LHOs uh, and engagement through community planning partnerships, etc. 
uh, we're trying to maximise in terms of making sure that as part of our charging policy, we recover costs when those are incurred. Um, and we're also trying to make sure that we are tapping into all of the funding streams that Scottish Government um, offer to us. Um, an example being the kind of decarbonisation of carbon, etc. So you have to be in all of those spaces. Um, but I, but we definitely accept the, the, the thought process that you need to then say, well, where's the overarching around all this? And are you making sure that collectively you're there for maximising the revenue? Um, so I, I welcome the, the, the audit from, from that perspective. Um, and we have undertaken to uh, both provide that additional oversight and scrutiny, uh, particularly through the Good Governance Board, um, and that finance will be the kind of central repository uh, for grant uh, and financials um, and also the conditions. Because what has happened is that, that a lot of those, that grant uh, information is sitting at that local level. Um, and the, the audit has highlighted, well, that's great, but people move around and, and you don't have that central repository. Um, so uh, we welcome the, the audit uh, and we understand the, the kind of recommendations and uh, are accepting of that and, and have therefore responded accordingly. I think the only other thing that I would probably want to highlight is that there is other work that the service is doing to, to maximise revenue as well. Um, so uh, as, as an example, um, we are a uh, as, as part of our resource spending review, um, we are very much uh, focused on engaging with those local senior officers um, to make sure they are adopting a consistent approach in terms of revenue maximisation um, and that they are they are following the charging policy. Uh, and the Director of Service Delivery um, has, uh, has taken an action and, and has uh, subsequently delivered against that. Um, we're also making sure that as part of the budget process for this year, uh, in particular, that we are making sure that any of the unbudgeted income um, is identified and streamed into the normal process. Um, and we have uh, identified opportunities to, to increase potentially income generation um, in response to resource spending review, um, for example, through considering um, training, whether we can uh, do uh, an external training in, in the future. Um, that comes with additional risks, um, but it's certainly something that we are, we're considering as part of the resource spending review. And finally, the, another area that we're looking for to, to, to uh, in terms of work is that we are uh, as part of the reform collaboration group and specifically around the blue light uh, collaboration group. We are reviewing um, income generation and particularly events um, across the three emergency services. So we are looking at you know police, um, ambulance, and ourselves who would perhaps attend a specific event. Are we making sure that we are all getting the right uh, uh, recovery of income uh, from those events? And equally, that would help us to identify well how come there might be a gap there um, when we when we actually plan it all out. Um, so we are undertaking that activity again to try and make sure that we are consistent and um, but also just really to try and maximize um, our, our revenue um, because I think a lot of this has, has to be uh, placed on the service to say what are you doing to kind of maximize income. Thanks John. Right. Uh, questions, comments? <coughs> Leslie? Thanks Gary, thanks John. Um, a couple of questions. A comment first on the event revenue maximisation. I welcome what you said, John, about working with the other blue light services. Uh, I know uh, working at the council for event organisers were continually complaining about the costs from the police, but were, didn't complain about the costs from anywhere else. And it just makes me wonder whether the police were upping the ante, whether we could do similar. But uh, I'm glad that work, works in, is in hand. Um, in relation to the recommendation on page eight, the recommendation appears to talk about oversight should be centralised, responsible party should consider whether current funding is fully used, um, assess all available funding opportunities. The management action says we'll improve the vis visibility of external funding. So it seems to me is, well, the question, is there a mismatch between the recommendation and the management action? And as part of the response to that, please, can I ask both Gary and John whether consideration was given to the, the creation of a 
or moving somebody into a role for a time lim limited period, six months or a year, and uh, putting them on to maximising funding. Uh, it's a, an approach that's been used elsewhere, and basically your performance target is that the individual concerns makes, you know, certainly covers their salary, but the, the target being for them to raise two, three, four, five, six times their salary. So was consideration given to that? Um, but so question is about the recommendation, the management response on page uh, eight and whether consideration was given to a specific role like that. Thanks. So the audit uh, side of that, we thought the recommendation around how do you centralise some of these functions to provide the right oversight across the various activities was the right one to make. The decision around, well, how do you implement that recommendation in the round really is one for management and the management response is that they can achieve that through the good governance board largely. Um, but it is over to management to decide, well, how what's the best way that the organisation should do that? Um, and, you know, Leslie, you're asking the right type, types of questions, but I guess the assurance needs to come from management about whether that will achieve what you're looking for. Yeah, just on that point. Yeah, so if I could respond, Leslie, um, you're absolutely right. The uh, recommendation was to say, well, look, either a role or a group or, or something that, that should be uh, put forward to, to, to give that oversight. And we felt, and I had a discussion with, with Mark uh, McAteer on this, that we felt as a, as a collective, um, all the heads of functions go to, to well, the majority of the heads of functions go to the Good Governance Board. So that gave us a good oversight in terms of well, what else should we see. Um, and we also wanted to ensure that by reporting that to that Good Governance Board, we could then say, well, look, you know, is there is there gaps there? Are, are we seeing uh, through that process that what we've reported as an example, well, let's look at the external funding in this year. Uh, uh, why have we not maximised that, that 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 external funding? And why is it being carried forward into the future year, etc.? And um, so, by having all of the individuals around that table of, of the Good Governance Board, we thought that would give us a, a better oversight rather than a, a specific individual person um, being identified with with that role. So, so that was the, the rationale that we used for for for, for that recommendation or response. Leslie, are you content with that response? If, if I could come come back on a couple of points, please. Uh, thanks to both of you. Um, so, John, if I understand you correctly, I think you said that finance has the centralising role because the recommendation is more about scrutiny of external funding. The representation is about the recommendation is about um, assessing funding opportunities and making and maximises them. I think you said earlier that finance will take on that role. Is that correct? Yes. Uh -huh. so, 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 so if you'd like, finance are going to be the guardians of, of that information, um, but that doesn't mean to say that that, that then allows, hopefully, uh, additional scrutiny um, by presenting reports on that external funding to say, well, look, what external funding have we received in the year? Um, how has it that then been spent? Um, have we maximised that, that external funding or where we're not able to, to do so because of delays or whatever. And we can then say, well, how does that compare to previous years, et cetera? So it's, a, it's hopefully a method of, of, of applying additional scrutiny um, and uh, hopefully therefore maximising revenue for the organisation. OK, so I, I get that. Just, just a point for perhaps for consideration. It would have been helpful to see that uh, response in the report that came to us and maybe we've got a heading management action but maybe management response management action you know might have might have been helpful there uh, so you've given us a fuller uh, understanding uh, of why the management action is as it is but you've told us that verbally uh, it, question mark would it have been helpful I think I would have found it helpful to have management response i.e we're going to do this within finance management action and the scrutiny of it will be through the good governance board but I, I leave that hanging as something between you and, and Gary and now neither of you have come back specifically to the point was consideration given to a tasking an individual with this with kind of targets for a um, covering their, their salary costs and an additional grant that would not otherwise have been uh, drawn down. I think I did respond by saying that I, I we, we considered um, that the, the, the our thought process that was that the, the response would be met by having that as part of a group mm -hmm. rather than having a specific role. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, if if I could maybe add, I, I I understand your your train of thought, Leslie, because one one of my questions uh, was was really around: is the Good Governance Board actually the right group to to be dealing with? From the title of the group, it's not obviously, but I don't know the detail of what they do, so it may well be. But the benefit, I guess, in having a, an individual who's tasked with a specific job and has specific objectives is that there's a, a discipline around about that. And my concern, and time will tell whether it's founded or not, is that a group, a good governance group, which has got such a broad church of representation, becomes a bit of a talking shop round about the issue. So I, I guess it would be to to, to just get some sort of assurance that it that it won't be that you know that it will be set in the agenda, and it will be kind of policing the organisation to make sure that that's that's delivered ultimately. Okay, uh, other questions, Tim. Uh, yes, thank you. It's a, a, an interesting read, and mine are really my comments will really be observations as much as anything else but I, i'm pleased to to see that there's recommendations to take a more coordinated approach to this important uh, aspect of the of the service but the the piece that seemed to me to be missing so this is my comment so i'm not necessarily expecting anybody to to give me a, a fulsome answer to this but the piece that seemed to be missing was we were talking about you know, grant funding and applications for funding and that type of fundraising, also charge back for services. The piece that's completely missing for me is any kind of commercialization. No mention in here of IP licensing uh, or our approach or the services approach to that. I know we're doing innovative things. We see, we hear reports about work with um, you know the electric vehicle. We we hear about work on the specialised helmets that are being done in conjunction with universities. We've talked about the sophisticated algorithms that we've used in developing the CRIM, all of this stuff. And, and for me, all of these speak to IP generation and considerable revenue generation opportunities. And there's lots of reference to you know documents around this. I don't know whether documents included in that include you know standard boilerplate IP agreements, but there's that whole aspect of revenue generation. Um, that seems to be completely missing from the report. Yeah. Uh, again, that might be an oversight in the way that the terms of reference were put together, but it's, it's an aspect of the service that I think we, we neglect too much. And if the coordinated approach to looking at the revenue maximization of the service is what comes out of this, then I don't want to get operational, but I would, can I suggest that the service looks of that type of um, function within that and that type of activity within that, because I think it's a missed opportunity at the moment. And, and just before there's a response to that, uh, Tim, just to, 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 to remind us, at a meeting on the 28th of June, we talked specifically about um, extending the terms of reference to cover that type of thing. So it was particularly disappointing to, to see that it, it didn't, didn't do that because I thought the purpose of bringing these draft assignment plans to the committee was to give the committee the opportunity to share its thoughts and provide its perspective. And I thought the suggestion of extending the scope to, to cover that was, was an entirely reasonable one and understood, I certainly understood that that was the case. So when I saw the final report and saw that it wasn't, that, that was disappointing. But in, in terms of the substantive point that Tim has raised, which I still think is entirely valid. It is, is there an aspect of this that would just not cover it? I suppose to, to answer that point, um, I would say that we, we are considering um, intellectual property and, do, yeah. and, and Richard can um, perhaps give a bit more, uh, it's perhaps more difficult to, to, to commercialise those things, but um, I know we have considered it, but uh, Richard, I don't know if you want to, to add any further. Yeah, so we do, yeah, we do. So we do put in boilerplate IP agreements on those things that you mentioned and, and sort of research practices and pieces with the universities, both for theirs and ours, uh, uh, benefit and protection 
um, in my time here, that's what we've done universally with any of these things. Whether any of them have then turned into anything at this point, given the stage of the development, not yet. So, you know, in terms of use of in innovative AI and algorithms, there are IPs in place for those, but whether that turns into anything, who knows? But there is IPs in place. Can I, can I just come back on that? I, um, I'll just make the obvious point. IP doesn't just make money by itself. No, no. It has to go to market. Yes. And that's that's the piece in here that is there's there's absolutely no reference to that or indeed any mechanism by which the service would actually go about doing that and again it's for the service to decide how it does it but i was really disappointed that there's no reference to it in here it's kind of it, it relates to, to leslie's point around you know how do you go about maximizing your your grant funding you know is it putting somebody in place whose job it is to actually do that like you know again it's for the service to decide how it does it but there's no no reference in here at all it seems to me to that kind of more commercialized activity and it will always be an opportunity missed it seems to me unless we get to grips with it. Yeah. so richard where is the where is the policy around that commercialization I don't, uh, there is, I don't believe there is a policy around commercialization. Um, the, the, the IP, the approach to putting IPs in place seems, seems to be a wholly sensible approach that we would need to do for the kind of innovation work that we're undertaking. And then in terms of looking at where we then move to market on some of those, that again depends on the individual um, piece of work in the project. There is one at the moment we're working with a, the, the folk in, in Glasgow around one of the AI pieces and the, perhaps is a route to market there that we're, that we're looking at with them yep. and getting that assistance from, from that innovation centre. Um, but in terms of a blanket approach to these things, not, no. So is there, is there an, an opportunity here because there's, there's some overarching policy or guidance uh, around income generation, income maximisation, can we simply extend that to include IP commercialization because, because if there's no statement of strategic intent then mm. you know, as the Tim kind of implies it, it won't happen and and I know Tim you've spoken quite passionately about mm. the potential opportunities for this uh, recognizing that it's not necessarily an easy thing to no, do no, but, no. but if we don't set out some degree of, of kind of guardrails for, for trying to do it then then I don't see how we will do it. I mean, I, I think from, from my perspective, the committee makes some excellent points around about that. I think as we, being brutally honest, um, maximising revenue has not been something that the service has sought to do mm -hmm. up to now. However, we're about to enter a different phase mm -hmm. um, within our life cycle as an organisation brought about by the resource spending review. We've certainly been having early discussions as an SLT regarding how we maximise revenue coming into the organisation. Now, there are clear um, capability issues within the organisation because it's not something that we've got any great knowledge or experience round about, but it's certainly something that I would give a commitment that we're looking at at the moment, uh, but we would need to do it in a, in a manner that we were comfortable that we would be making investments that we could get returns on. Mm -hmm. um, so we would need to have the capability to do it and there might be other knock-on impacts on our <clears throat> budget anyway. So we just need to make sure that any efforts we put into this space was going to give us the, the benefits yeah. that we would receive. But I can certainly give you assurances from a strategic perspective that as we move forward, we will look at a whole without going into any specifics, because there's clearly some specific things that have been put on the table here, but I could certainly give you the general assurance that we will be looking at a whole host of things we can do going forward to maximise the income generation opportunities that we've got in the future. Yeah, uh, that, that that's really welcome, uh, Ross. And, and, and what I would say, almost in balance of that, um, I feel that in some respects we, we we are driven by the wrong motive here we're driven by seeking out money and then working out the purpose kind of later on 
and I, I, I'm, I'm, I was really struck by the, the section on strategic alignment that, you know, looking at examples, there is no reference to the strategic purpose for doing these things. Um, and if I think, you know, and, and I don't know if this is an example, but the electric um, appliance that we got funding for was there quite clearly a strategic context for the appliance at this time? You know, where the whole life costs of making that commitment properly kind of considered. So there's a real danger that if you if you turn this to be about income maximization, these are some of the dangers that you might encounter. You know, it, it has to be what is it we're trying to achieve and how what might we be able to exploit different income streams to support that yeah. rather than it becoming an end in itself. And and there's a feeling and, and actually it, it, when you look at the cast of people who were interviewed as part of the, the audit, I thought, how have all these people got an interest in this? So it, it's a further example where I think it's devolved, you know, speaking to LSOs, you know, someone comes up with a bright idea. You know, that's not to to knock that on the head, but it has to be more strategic than that. Uh, so, so that's what I would kind of make a, a plea for. Um, sure. Yeah, if I could just come in on that, please. So, in terms of the discussions that the chief had mentioned, and you'll be aware of some of this from from the strategic planning piece. There is that commitment, both in terms of the framework and the strategic plan around innovation. And I think there's a clear uh, there's a clear opportunity there in terms of that strategic direction for innovation. As part of that has to be around commercialization and taking those opportunities. Yeah. Those are sort of live discussions about how we how we do that. Um, and, a, and a lot of that focuses at the moment, or at least at this point, in recognizing that service does pursue innovation, but perhaps not as strategically as it, as it should, which is why it's now a clear commitment within the strategy. So there is that opportunity there, I think. Good. Thanks, Richard. Um, Gary and then Leslie. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just very quickly, I'd, um, I do accept when reading the report again, actually, that we we possibly haven't drawn out those commercial um, activity options as much as maybe the committee was hoping for. And um, but one of the things that we did in the review, <clears throat> and it, it is in there, it's just not as clear as maybe you were expecting, is we we state quite clearly in paragraph 1.3 that there is no documented process for identification of all possible funding or revenue generating activities. It doesn't yet exist. And I think that's come through in the, the management response. And it's been really good to hear that discussion because I think, um, you know, the organization itself is re reframing its strategy around revenue maximization. Uh, and, and hopefully this report is helping. But we didn't as auditors say, well, what about this um, revenue maximization activity or this one or these alternative options of which there are many. We thought that's really a management activity to do and the audit is telling you that the arrangements that are in place to do that type of activity aren't uh, happening at a corporate level as much as they should. But just to accept I think the comments that we we didn't in the report bring that out possibly as strongly as uh, the committee were hoping for. Thanks Gary. Uh, Leslie. Thanks, Brian. Um, well done, Tim, for raising this. And I think uh, you, the comments that you made and Brian made about it not being more explicit in the report, though, except what Gary's just said, uh, were very well made. Um, I picked up in this issue um, with Ian Morris and a couple of his colleagues in relation to uh, the new fire engine. And I think that there's, uh, it, it just gave me a wee bit of an insight, I think, that about uh, knowledge on uh, IP and how it can be handled. I think Ian had uh, kind of uh, assumed, without wanting to, 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 to disparage Ian, because he's so flippin' brilliant, um, but he'd assumed it was about getting patents. And uh, there are a whole range of other IP routes as well as getting patents. So that discussion, I think, just found quite interesting. Uh, and Ian, 
uh, was kind enough to say it had been helpful. Uh, but in terms of the way forward, I think maybe getting somebody from legal, getting you know a bright, <laughs> this is very ageist, a bright young thing from legal, a bright young thing from finance, you know, and a uh, with you. <laughs> you can all pass, you know. <laughs> Listen, I, I turned 60 at the weekend, you're all flipping bright and things. <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say was uh, have a chat, see if you can get hold of um, somebody from Scottish Enterprise or, or one or two of the directors of commercialisation. From the, OK, I, I, Tim, Tim, Tim shakes his head, but but there are some there are some very good people who could be helpful in there but um or one or two of the directors of commercialization at the universities yeah. uh, and just just say look gonna just talk to us about this are there opportunities here is it worth it how do we go about it and i suspect some kind of partnering arrangement with uh, the the to, to use the jargon dated jargon technology transfer the commercialization partnering with the commercialization units that there are at one or more of the universities but i think that might be a way into it um so it, just a suggestion oh thanks leslie thanks um john okay just um you're, you're, you're not as old as you look <laughs> Maybe with the thought process that someone could maybe teach an old dog new, new tricks then on that basis um I guess probably it's been a really helpful discussion and we do appreciate it. And I think, you know, Ross highlighted it, there is an element around capability um, and therefore I think reaching out, uh, particularly Leslie, um, Tim did shake his head when we talked about Scottish Enterprise, <laughs> um, but perhaps... Just my prejudice is coming through. So. But perhaps if, even if I can take that action to say, like, we will now look to engage with those universities around uh, those uh, commercialisation opportunities, just to, to see is there any merit in the, um, some of those partnerships around it um, and see where that leads us and you never know we might come back six months saying look actually that's been really fruitful um, but if i take it as an action at least uh, would that be helpful to, to the community very much yeah thanks thanks we've got some of that in fledgling already with a couple of universities so i can certainly assist with that yeah. and ash has been doing some work on the IP stuff, so you know, it's not it's not a barren landscape here. And she is bright and young. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, to you, Bud. <laughs> um, Ellen Musk come to the next meeting. Uh, <laughs> uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, I, I I think this has been an excellent uh, report in terms of provoking, you know. Discussion and, and, and sort of lateral thoughts. I did wonder, John, about the the timescale for some of the the recommendations. I mean, they, they appear to be kicked off to the right quite a bit for some things that appear pretty straightforward. You know, there's a couple at September 23, um, and there's there's one at, at June 23, which is relating to nearly extending. And evaluation process, and I know I'm probably over simplifying it, but could I maybe just ask for a bit of reflection on these timescales to see if they can be pulled forward a bit? Can I maybe respond to, to that? Because I guess of course one of the things that we're obviously reflecting on is was there capacity to deliver these things? Because these yeah. things are, are not done in isolation, um, and we know that we are going through one resource spending review. Yeah. Um, we have a number of uh, various agendas uh, at a kind of corporate level that, that will mean that we will be particularly busy. Um, and so therefore those timelines are actually saying, well, look, we need to take account of some of those elements um, and make sure that we can then deliver against uh, what we are saying in terms of those dates. So I, I, I guess, you know, we, we obviously fed that back through to ASET itself. Um, and I guess one of the things that Azets had always said to us is, look, you know, you, you've forever uh, been over optimistic and and, and therefore um, we, we have considered it and we are like looking at it in, in response to our capacity. So uh, it's not that we're just suddenly saying, oh, well, let's just kick that down to, to as long as possible to think about it. It was a conscious decision based on our capacity. And specifically when I've consulted and discussed it at length. <laughs> no, <laughs> and, and if I were you, Lynn, I would do exactly the same. <laughs> uh, I, I think, though, 
and and it's it's for you to judge. Obviously, it's not for the committee to to, to set up and impose time scales. But what I would maybe ask is that if it if it can't be done in its entirety, are there some quick things that need to be done? Done because you know a key message here is it's a bit fragmented. Can we in a quick and dirty sort of way? You know, pull something together, and and I think that's that underlies some of the problem with some of the old recommendations not being implemented because we go for that kind of gold-plated response, whereas you know, one is that actually needed? But but if it is needed, is there something that we can do in sharper time that will that will assure sixty percent of the issue? I suppose what I can do is undertake that as part of a progress report in terms of how we're getting it going. That would be that follow up. We'll, we'll, you know, so there is an end point, yeah. but equally we're able to demonstrate through our progress yeah. what we're doing around that. And because it's, it doesn't mean to say that the end date is a is a hard date that you have to wait for. And we we can we, we can uh, progress uh, as part of that. But take your point. Yeah, because that. we might be retired by that point. No. So. But that would be helpful if there's a if there's an undertaking that in the in the follow up progress report that there's there's a bit of an update to to kind of that okay, like, let's see absolutely, that. absolutely. <laughs> and it's just to kind of give a bit of comfort as John said, this isn't an end point that we are saying we will not do anything and if it's September twenty three we won't do anything yeah. till August. We will be actioning these kind of straight away and getting the ball rolling and also it allows us that time to go through the governance routes and make sure that we're carrying out things appropriately. So yeah. if we can deliver it prior to that date, we certainly will. Yeah, no, that's that's brilliant. Okay, um that's that's been a really helpful discussion. Thanks, Gary, for the report and thanks to everyone for, for contributing that. If if we can move into the second report, which is around uh, post pandemic review and, and Gary over to you again. Yes, thank you, Chair. So this review looked at uh, the post pandemic uh, response from the fire service and it found that, um, uh, you know, as you might expect, that overall the fire service responded really well to the COVID-19 pandemic. It did that at pace. It ensured the continuity of the service. And since then, in the Recovery, Reset and Renew programme, it's put in place really robust frameworks to manage that uh, emergence from the from the pandemic in, in a really strong way. And that's all very positive. Um, uh, we include a large number of best practice areas within the uh, the key findings, and that 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 gives you a strong sense of the uh, of the strength of the arrangements put in place by management to manage that overall process. But we also draw out three uh, areas for further improvement, um, uh, and they're quite important areas. One is around uh, embedding in business continuity plans, learning from the uh, from the post -pan from the pandemic, so that you know that you are able to um, to continue in the future, and you've got good arrangements for those which embed that learning. Um, really around finalising the organisation's posture in relation to future working arrangements, and that will have significant impacts for staffing, workforce planning, estates management. It's a really important area for the organisation to to bed down um, what its future plans are going to be. And then just to document actions uh, within the, uh, the Triple R programme so that you are demonstrating that you are delivering uh, those actions in accordance with the timelines that have been set for the organisation. Uh, happy to take any questions on any detailed part of the review. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gary. And uh, in, in terms of an initial response, is it is it Ross or, or Stuart who might want to just comment? I'm, on I'm, 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 I'm the name sponsor yeah, on this, uh, but the responsibility is laid. Uh, lying with the role of Deputy Chief Officer, but I'm quite happy to say a few words. First of all, thanks to Gary and the team for the, the audit. Um, as you can see, there was quite a number of senior colleagues that were involved in the audit process, and that demonstrates the seriousness that we gave at the time and that we gave to the recovery, reset and renew process, and hopefully it added to the richness of the evidence that Gary and his team were able to, to gather really welcome the um, identification of the areas for 
good practice. It's always nice for those to be highlighted, particularly for the staff that have worked so hard to deliver those particular areas. Uh, and again, really grateful for the recommendations as well. Uh, I'll not go into any of the specific recommendations because great members might want to <coughs> questions about it, but welcome the recommendations, accept all of the recommendations and work has commenced to action those. Um, and this really does help us um, within the whole landscape of business continuity planning as we move forwards and, and it complements work that was done internally, coordinated by Richard with Smart to, to, to undertake a full organisational debrief, which has given us a lot of learning and previous work that was done by His Majesty's Inspector as well, round with our preparedness and response to the yeah. pandemic. So all of these things um, give us a really rich um, evidence source to, to make improvements yeah. going forward. So thanks to Gary and the team for, for adding this particular report to that mix. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Um, comments, questions? Right. Dave, not John. Five parts. <laughs> well, actually, it's only three uh, No, I, I think this is this is a good report, and obviously you, you reference the other pieces of work that have been done in this this territory. Uh, I, I think a couple of things. Um, that kind of spring to mind. Um, the, the control objective round about efficiency savings and modernisation um, and the risk of reverting to you know doing what we did before, I don't feel really comes through kind of strongly enough in, in, in this report in terms of what is it we're actually doing to really mitigate that risk that we do just drift back into what we're doing. Because I believe that there is a lot being done it's just it would have been helpful, I think, to, to have a, a kind of summary here because I know certainly in other sectors, particularly health, are investing <coughs> excuse me, a lot of time and effort in reflection and and, and making sure that they don't revert back. Not least of all because they simply don't have the money to allow them. But I mean, hey, we have not in a dissimilar situation from that. So I, I guess Going forward, it would be good to, to get some sort of assurance uh, round about how we're, how we're doing that. I, I thought the stuff round about kind of hybrid working and agile working and, and our approach to making it clear, you know, whether people can, should work at home. I, it felt a wee bit surprising that there wasn't more clarity at this point round about that, so I would welcome maybe just to comment on that. Sure. In terms of your first point, um, Brian, and it's something that um, probably doesn't come through much within the report, um, thanks to a lot of work that was done with, with the auditors and then they had taken on a lot of feedback that we gave when we got the first draft, which again was appreciated, but a lot of the work, um, a normal expectation would have been for the recovery, reset and renew work to reach a natural conclusion. And the point that you make regarding ensuring that we don't regress back to previous inefficient ways of working would have been addressed in that. Unfortunately, because of the operating environment, the, the recovery, reset and renew group stood down prematurely right. because we then focused on the staffing tactical action group work that Stuart led. But the work wasn't lost. It was more just it went in a slightly different direction, but they were able to take a lot of the good work that had been done through COVID and as we were putting in place innovative solutions round about um, recruitment, retention, development, and they were able to take those lessons forward through a separate work stream. So it's probably not come through this audit because this audit almost or this work almost had a, a, a change in direction and then went down the staffing tag route. But the, the lessons were absolutely taken forward into that. In terms of the agile working, um, I think we again we, we engaged with ASETS regarding the specific wording of that, and I think it was very much uh, as often happens as management. We had a particular perception about how. 
that approach was being taken across the organisation, but clearly the people that were interviewed through the audit had a different perception, and clearly uh, we need to address that. So we, we had thought that there was quite a, a, a clear communication round about how agile working would be approached. Right. Uh, we have now learned that that's not the case across the organisation, so we are re-emphasising how that's going to work with managers and staff. And the second really key point to that is, and about work that we are actively pursuing at the moment uh, and with partners is looking at our corporate estates because we have prior to the pandemic uh, occurring we had corporate buildings that could accommodate pretty much all staff coming to their work all the time if we have got agile working which sees staff having a blend of being at home and being in the workplace then clearly that gives us opportunities to rationalize our corporate estate and to do that in conjunction yeah. with partners so again, that was work that was ongoing, but it's been really helpful for the audit to highlight that so that we can formalise that and, and have some scrutiny around it as well. Yeah, no, that's helpful, Ross, and, and, and the point about the message being communicated, but when you get that feedback, it's not landed in the way that you know, that these things happen. So, um, so that's really helpful. And I mean, part of my comments about um, efficiencies and changing practices and not reverting is that there is particular emphasis given to space utilisation, which is an important aspect of it, but it's only one aspect mm -hmm. of it. So maybe just if just to clarify that, that taking forward that piece of work, will, will, will that, how, how will that sort of report itself uh, and, and will it sort of surface either here or at the board at, at some point? Come in on that, if that's okay. Because um, I think that there's a, I suppose there's a couple of areas um, that you've highlighted and you've, you've uh, certainly highlighted the kind of efficiency saving side of things. It's not to say that we've not all, not captured some of these things already. Um, so as part of the budget setting process for last year, um, we looked at some of the elements that are coming through from uh, the reset. We knew we knew that it was going to be not just something that happens just one year it would be a continuous process yeah. uh, and so therefore it's another area that we're looking to identify as part of the normal budget setting process but also I suppose overlaying the, 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 the additional emphasis now in terms of the resource spending review and particularly because we are looking to, to seek a, a number of tactical savings uh, next financial year so that will provide that rich um, tapestry of, of, of areas that we need to make sure that we are, we are, we are absolutely um, drilling into to see is that now going to be reflected in our budget for, for, yeah. for future year um, and it's also captured as a, a an outstanding audit action from a Deloitte perspective and it was recognised that there was uh, work being done previous year but there was work to be done this year as well as part of that, that process so I do think we are capturing <laughs> these elements Brian um, but the work is not complete because, as, as Ross has indicated, that there was a lot more uh, things that were going on. But I think the resource spending review puts that into sharp yeah. focus. And I, I wouldn't expect the work to be complete, John. I, I think what I would, what I'm looking for is that there is a <coughs> a process with which we are engaged that has some sort of terms of reference you know what is it we're actually looking at and what's it we're going to do with it um, because what I have seen emerging is and uh, recognize of course that this is new for everyone but what seems to be emerging is is best practices that organizations are producing some sort of report on their analysis of, of the issue you know we've changed practices but you know these are the things that have changed. These are the things that we absolutely want to retain, um, you know. And uh, there's clear then evidence that that that's been done as an organisation, and in doing that, mitigating that, that very real risk that we just over a period of time sink back. But uh, that's that that's that's really helpful. Yeah, and I think in terms of that report, it's probably sitting in a number of different areas at the moment. Brian, um, and certainly someone we can look to bring all that together because we've got. We've now got an action, a series of actions based on an internal audit report. We've got an, an action plan based on Robert's 
most recent report in yeah. our COVID work and also the internal debrief it has got a series of actions and action plans. So they're sitting in different pockets, but I agree, if you, something that pulls that together would be very helpful. And in terms of the future savings piece, um, that will absolutely be through the full board that governance yeah. because we will make we've not made any decisions round about future savings we have been having a lot of discussions and developing proposals that will come to the board and it will then lead itself into the 23-24 budget setting process thereafter right okay thank you okay. um chair yeah just uh just listening to the discussion and reflecting on the earlier discussion so um uh, the internal audit plan includes a look at um uh, corporate performance reporting and uh, how the organization plans to report strategically around corporate per performance you would imagine would include incorporate aspects of um efficiency plans and efficiency savings through the normal kind of budget process and just to reflect the, um you know we would expect through that work to to capture some of those reporting and monitoring arrangements Thanks, Kelly. That's a good point. Um, conscious of, of time and my absolute inability to, to manage it, um, <laughs> but the, the final the, the final point on this part of the agenda is the enhanced management response. Stuart, are you going to? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm also conscious of time at, at the board chair. So um, I was asked to provide an enhanced management response following the presentation of the portfolio office uh, internal audit by, by assets. Um, the paper presented today seeks to do that, um, primarily around the pace, effectiveness and resourcing of change and the need the commitment of SLP to support that. So um, kind of three points of perhaps just amplify slightly is around about governance. So we've seen in the paper that we are proposing new governance structures to support the portfolio office. Um, those have been approved by SLT last week. Um, there's also a commitment to streamline our reporting processes and to improve our performance management uh, arrangements around about uh, the change portfolio. Alongside that, we're also working to enhance our resourcing of the portfolio office. And Curtis has completed a business case uh, which has been sent to me yesterday, and we'll start to go through the um, governance uh, processes in terms of supporting that or otherwise. I guess I probably should highlight, and it keeps coming up today, in terms of the resource spending review. Clearly, the backdrop of the resource spending review um, will need to be taken into account when we can get the resources into the portfolio office. But we're also looking to realign a number of resources internally that are supporting change and put them under the auspices uh, of the portfolio office as well. And I guess the last point around the resources is ensuring that we seek technical expertise uh, where required for our uh, recognising issues that we've identified technical as part. And, and so the last point around about resourcing would be around about the collaboration with our blue light partners and identifying what capacity um, and capability that those have to support a blue light approach to um, to, to, to change, particularly again in light of the, the, the review. And the, the last part is just to give some assurance to the committee around about the review of the ongoing projects in order to identify any capacity um, or challenge uh, with, with those to ensure there's that strategic alignment with those in flight projects. Uh, and to obviously review the business cases of the work. So I'll pause at that. I'm happy to take any other questions on, on the paper. Thanks, Stuart. I mean, that's really filled in the gaps that, that I think we felt we had from the last meeting. Any questions, comments? Gary? Um, Chair, not, not a question or a comment on this, but just to note that you missed the progress update on internal audit recommendations, but um, yeah, but not not a comment on this. Um, you may have deliberately done that, so uh, <laughs> so quite happy for you to miss out. Well, no, it wasn't deliberate, but uh, it would have been effective in terms of making up a bit of time. But, uh, <laughs> no, so we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, yeah. So, any questions on on Stuart's uh, update on on what we agreed was an important issue? No, I think Stuart, that's that's a really positive situation because I think you have delivered in the paper and by your commentary the assurances that, that we needed, which I don't think we doubted that strategic response was there. It's just it wasn't evident in the actual management responses in the in the report. So thank you very much for that. Um, Gary, yes, thank you. Um, 
progress update on internal audit recommendations. Um, Chair, just to say that the organisation continues to make good progress in implementing internal audit recommended actions. We do raise one thorny issue, which is around um, water planning, where it's difficult for the organisation to get a service level agreement in place, which was the original action. And I think management are putting forward to the committee um, a course of action to uh, for the organisation to take that forward without it constantly appearing as a um, non-delivered action. Um, I don't have anything further to say on on the report and happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Gary. And and we have a paper later in the private session on, on that. Any questions uh, on this? Tim? Uh, yeah, I suppose it's just a general comment that there's a, a number of actions that I hesitate to say this have been put upon the ICT department and they've responded to assets and the responses in numerous cases seem to be inadequate. Um, and, and I'm not sure there's much much mileage in going through each each and every one of them. I'm just wondering, is there a is this a communication issue? Do you think, Gary, or or is it something deeper than that that they're not clear about what's being asked to be provided, or are they just not able to provide what what you're looking for? Um, so it's a small team and the um in resource terms they have a big agenda to deliver and i think that may be it, it is probably better for officers to respond to that question they will certainly know more than the auditor does um, but 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 i think resource capability and capacity in that team is something that the, the management are already looking at okay okay you content with that sir? <laughs> Well, as content as I'll, I'll ever likely to be, I think, on it. Um, there is a, also a, another point of, I, if, if there's a mention. John, did you Sorry, object John, on no, it? All I was going to say was, I, I guess it's part of the normal process, and, and I think we've received quite a bit of uh, assets, um, quite rightly, pushing back, and not just on the ICT area. Um, so uh, they've looked at the kind of um, what we were doing in terms of the investigation report and they're saying look that's not quite enough and um, we want a wee bit more mm -hmm. and we want that evidence to, to be demonstrated so it's it's partly a natural process as well that sometimes you you know individuals say well i didn't realize you had you wanted three months of of, of evidence around that um, and therefore we're, 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 we're going to to uh, put that that process or, or we'll give you evidence for the evidence around it so it, it is very much part of a normal process. I know that you're focused on the, the ICT side of things, but there are other areas that as it's um, demonstrate that as well. Yeah. Can I just respond? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's not so much, John, and I, I appreciate exactly what you're saying, but it's not that I'm focused on the ICT things. It's the ICT things draw your eye to them by virtue of the fact that it is almost always their responses that are pushed back as being inadequate. So it's not not me looking through this and picking out the ICT ones. It's the, they jump out at you because they are the ones that assets say, well, you provided us with this, and that's not actually what we are after. Uh, and so I'm not I'm not trying to beat ICT up. ICT are beating themselves up. It seems to me um, by just not responding in the way that they've been asked to respond. Which is why I'm asking: Is it a communication issue? Is it that they don't understand? what is needed, or is there something deeper going on? And I, I say, I don't want to go through all of these things. It's just a trend that just mm. keeps yeah. popping up. Yeah. So is it a communication issue? I don't know. Or, or is it or is it deeper, as you say, around about yeah. capacity and capability? And and I think we've had discussions on, on this topic. Yeah, yeah I, I hate to keep raising it. Perspective, you know, Gary raised the, the issue of as a small team, there are capacity and capability issues within that team that we're, we're, we're aware of, and we're trying to address them as, as best we can. And probably without ICT colleagues around the table, we'd probably be unfair to discuss further, I would suggest. Yeah. yeah, but it is a big risk for the organization, and I think we need to make sure that we, we don't lose, lose it as being a big risk. There was one other thing I was going to yes, mention, if I, if I may share. 
And in 5A, it makes it saying there's a further board workshop to be held on the 19th of October. I don't think it is, is it? No. So it's just yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. No other comments, questions. Thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, and apologies uh, for running over time. Uh, let's take a break. Could we try and keep it to five minutes, if that's okay? Uh, just to refresh our cups and uh, do whatever else you need to do. Okay, so thanks for coming back so promptly. So we've got the independent audit inspection review update, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, well, it's a very brief paper there uh, for your information. Um, the point there about the um, verbal update around RDS terms and conditions coming back um, when, when uh, there's more progress or completion. However, obviously, most of you will be aware that those conversations are ongoing in terms of those RDS terms and conditions. Um, the substantive part in terms of the action plan, and you'll, you'll note the number of um, the number of uh, inspection reports are now moved move to green. Uh, only one remains uh, red in our eyes, and that's related to the operational risk information inspection um, published in 2019. I should say that the majority of those actions are complete. 20 out of the 25 are complete. The five that are remaining um, are related uh, to the uh, emergency service network connection project, which is a UK wide project. Um, again, we've spoken about that previously, but in terms of the, the, the reasons for that, um, essentially that, that's related to the, the late starting of that project, some of the funding related to that project. Uh, more, more recently, there are further delays to the UK project, most of that around procurement issues of equipment. Um, however, in terms of the specifics, um, if, you want, if you like, Chair, the specific um, recommendations that we're still working with, they mostly relate to in-vehicle solutions in terms of tablet solutions. Um, there is work progressing on the, mo on the majority of those one of which we expect to complete in a, in a reasonable time frame, or there is a slip against the original time frame um, in terms of equipment being ordered. Although checking checking on that first thing this morning, um, we, we don't know for definite whether the equipment will arrive as required again because of the broader issues around procurement of certain equipment, um, but those things are progressing. So essentially, Chair, uh, the vast majority complete, the vast majority of this is complete. However, we're marking it as red because of the slip in terms of the original time scales related to the um, UK wide program. Thanks, Richard. That's very helpful. Um, comments, questions? No, nope. no. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And then that takes us on to the external audit. And um, we have Caroline still on the call, John, but you, you're going to cover this item, are you? Yes. Um, so, uh, Primarily, is, is, is obviously the external audit actions um, fall as a kind of annual thing, but we agreed that we would provide a, an update to our outcome on a, on a quarterly basis. And um, so, I'm very conscious of time. So, I think in summary, we are making good progress against uh, those uh, audit actions, um, as you can see, and that's reflected in the sense just complete uh, around financial management, financial sustainability, governance and transparency, and value for money. Um, the only thing that I probably wanted to highlight uh, is one around two particular actions, um, 1.3 and 2.3, um, which is a, a, an area where I am uh, if I'm being honest, I'm struggling to 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 meet uh, the, the recommendation, which was around a uh, budget to outcome, um, and that's work that we're in kind of bugger discussion with Deloitte um, around that, um, so that we can have um, good examples as to where we can perhaps uh, deliver to uh, around that recommendation. Um, but conscious of time, and I just wanted to, to kind of. Uh, leave it at that, if that's okay, Jim. No, that's that, that's helpful, John, and, and thanks again for the uh, clarity of this report. It's, it's very easy to, to work through. Um, and and I, I'm not suggesting you come in, Caroline, but, but just for you to confirm that as part of your audit this time around, you'll be taking stock with, with the actions and where we've got to. Is that correct? 
that's right, uh, Brian. Yeah, we, that's what we're currently undertaking. Just a review of progress against previous actions, really. OK, great. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, yeah, John, I mean, you've highlighted 1.3 and, and 2.3, and we've discussed this, and, and indeed we covered it in the private session with Caroline this, this morning. We're, we're not going to resolve anything in further discussion today, but absolutely we all understand this is kind of work in progress, so um, we, we will uh, need to come to a position on this by the kind of year-end position. But, uh, but I, I think this this committee is is very clear on the challenges in implementing the the recommendation as currently drafted. So thank you for that. Um, that then takes us on to internal controls update, strategic risk register, and David, you're there as if by magic. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, the the report highlights the current position of the kind of risk registers. Um, section two or section three point two outlines the kind of changes, outlines the details um, for the committee, um, with the kind of following section starting to highlight some of the more specific changes being made um, during the last quarter. Um, I apologise, I was cut off earlier on. Chair, when you were talking about the kind of meeting that you held earlier, so I, I, I don't know how far you went into that, but. It's, it's about how we mature the process. I think we, we have got a lot of good information, but I think some of the discussions are how, how we can tailor that information to ensure it's understood um, more clearly. Um, and that work's been progressed um, with, with help from colleagues in data services. And quarter three into quarter four, it's, it's then starting to come back with some of different ways of presenting that information to, to not only ARAC, but all other committees. Um, and that includes some some work in terms of producing a dashboard for for risk as well. Um, but I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. And uh, when you were cut, cut off, I just spoke very briefly about the four points that came out of that discussion, and and said that uh, you were definitely the man for the job, <laughs> and that you were <laughs> fully on top of them. So. Uh, I think that's what you said. Uh, anyway, that, that's what we now understand to be the case. So thanks for that. Uh, questions for for David? No, no. I I think in part, David, it it, it reflects that that this is still, in some respects, a kind of work in progress. That that we're working towards a, a slightly different presentation of it. Um, but I, I just want to balance that and, and say that I, I don't want that to be interpreted that there's criticism of what's been done before because there has been a tremendous effort made across this organisation led by you, David, to get us to a point that we're at. And, and by comparison to other organisations, mm -hmm. this is really very good. I think what we're discussing now is just how we actually use it and could we tweak it so that we can actually use it more effectively so it's 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 not criticizing anything that's gone before in fact quite the contrary uh, I, I use this uh, i use the example of, of this service in talking to other organizations and, and describe it as an exemplar and and the way that they have gone about, about it so so nothing is intended to sound critical that being the case then, David, uh, thanks very much for, for the report. Um, and if we're happy, we'll, we'll move on. Um, Anti-fraud and whistleblowing, John. So, uh, Chair and Committee, I have nothing to report on this item. Um, so hopefully that speeds up the process. Which is always a good nil return. Thank you. OK. Um, Update on gifts, hospitality and interest, and that's back to you, David. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the, the report provides, Appendix A provides that um, current register of gifts, hospitality and interest. Um, that information is also published on our website. Um, I think there are a number of other gifts and areas that are retained um, within my, my own team and that kind of go by <coughs> threshold for reporting. But I think progress I, th I think some of the discussions before is about how we start to kind of better communicate 
Now, some of that's been done using the NFI process. I think there was some information provided as part of the kind of um, action log um, that's really saying we use that NFI process to kind of widen out some discussions in, in terms of potential interests. We widen out the discussion in terms of gifts and hospitality. It's it's an ongoing process here to try and ensure that people are aware of what it is that we're actually doing. And why I hope is that the register going forward will better reflect um, some of the main the main kind of gifts and hospitality um, areas that are being accepted by by the service. But I think why I hope is that we're we're showing progress in increasing the number um, of areas that are starting to be reported, and hopefully that will continue. Thanks, uh, David. That there's there's clearly a marked number of uh, increase in the number of entries, which, which is a a sign of you know the message getting through, and and hopefully that will continue to be the case. I I just wondered whether there's anything <coughs> that you wanted to add in terms of communicating that message, because we've talked about uh, communications, we've talked about training. Is there is there anything in particular that you want to Update us on. We we have produced, sorry, we have produced an LCMS package, or we have produced information that can go into an LCMS package, and that that work has been delayed during this year and um, due to other priorities. I think, however, we've that work will provide the kind of template within which we can go out and discuss gifts and hospitalities directly with with areas. It, it aligns to other areas such as fraud. Um, we're we're holding discussions and the kind of fraud risk assessment with heads of function. Um, they have begun and they will continue. It's it's not just something we we would look to do in isolation. I think when we're talking about interests, when we're talking about fraud, when we're talking about gifts, is is just trying to raise the awareness um, w within the organisation of that. Um, ho hopefully, and not hopefully, sorry, but I will be coming back to kind of both to the Good Governance Board and to the Audit Committee to kind of update and progress made in terms of those discussions. Um, but it's not just about gifts and hospitalities, Chair. It's, it's about that kind of wider aspect of awareness um, of, of fraud as well. And I absolutely support that, David. Thank you. Um, any questions for David? Rubbish gifts. I <laughs> <laughs> <can> try hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's why most of them are declined. It's a Christmas, aren't it? Uh, excellent, my talk. Yeah, yeah. A good point, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that, David. Um, uh, and we look forward to, to the next instalment of this. Uh, thank you. So that then takes us on to uh, Robert. Your your quarterly update. Thanks Chair, I'll keep it nice and brief. I'm sure you're glad to hear. Um, you've brought the paper in front of you. The activity that's taken place since our last meeting is around the service delivery area inspection of the East, where work is ongoing and progressing at a quick pace. Uh, not uh, too surprisingly, I suppose it's, the, the findings are very similar to what we found doing local area inspections. Um, so a lot of the, the Areas that we're covering in the service delivery area inspection will not be unfamiliar to you uh, and will be recurrent from previous local area inspections. What we are seeing, though, is some real good pockets of innovation at a local area, which are hopefully then influencing the national direction of travel, and we'll reflect that within the report. So there are certainly criticisms at a local level on a number of issues, but nothing that you haven't seen before. But what we are capturing is uh, both from your own staff and from partners is that that desire to drive forward the local agenda uh, is certainly being considered at community planning partnerships and at that local uh, level. So that's encouraging. The, the big thing for us will not be the gathering of information, but how we present the information, because we want this to look different to the local area inspections. We want it to be more useful and we want it to be an opportunity for uh, the service and the board to benchmark performance against a number of themes, as we spoke about before. So we're still in the, the stages of trying to develop what the final plan will look like, and we're coming together in the middle of this month to have a full day's session on kind of just exactly what that final product might uh, look like. That would be the most interesting bit for us, probably. It's a work in progress. It will be produced by the end of the financial year, 
uh, and we are still again considering how it should be presented and how what the route to the service is. Is it through SLT or previously would have been through local senior officers or DACO? So we're in those discussions as well, and we welcome your input in relation to that, I think. Uh, moving on then, thematic inspection work or firefighting in high-rise buildings thematic concluded and was laid before Parliament on the 27th of September. And I think it's important to note that the uh, report concludes that whilst that we consider there's scope for improvement in relation to this area, that our overall impression of the service in regards to firefighting and high-rise building is principally positive. Uh, I think we set out, and I, I articulated this, we set out to frame this in a Scottish context. So how Scottish Fire and Rescue Service respond to the built environment in Scotland, which allowed us probably to avoid some of the more contentious issues that are live in other parts of the UK. But it's right that we avoid them. And whilst we reference them in the report, they don't apply in Scotland because we don't have those super high rise buildings that are a real issue when it comes to evacuation. We do reflect in the report that your evacuation policy is a work in progress and is in draft at this point. And we write into the report that we may well come back and consider that element of your business at some point in the future. We'll keep a very watchful gaze over that uh, policy as it develops. But I was encouraged by the two uh, exercises that I attended to test that draft policy. Uh, and I certainly saw progress from exercise one to exercise two. So that tells me that work is ongoing. Uh, and I'll be interested to see what the final product looks like. The recommendations contained within the report there are eight, uh, but we also reflected five areas of good practice. And as I said, when I took this post on 18 months ago, that was be my approach, not only to look for recommendations and areas of weakness, but also to reflect areas of good practice. Uh, and hopefully we've achieved that in all of the reports that have been published since my time as Chief Inspector. That's the approach we'll continue to take for as long as I'm in the post. Um, and also I think our engagement on this one in particular was particularly positive. We, we gave the service early sight of the document at various stages. We engaged informally before we went to formal consultation. And again, I think you get a better product as a result of that no surprises agenda. Uh, and it just saves time at the end, actually, because people have got an early sight of what's coming. So I think that's, again, an approach that we've, we've adopted and hopefully will continue to, to, to use if the service deem that to be helpful. Uh, we're in the process of, um, sorry, just quickly on that one, two, rec two of the recommendations in here are a wee bit contrived, and it's probably worth pointing that out because um, within the Act, I can only make recommendations to Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. <laughs> what I would love to have made were recommendations <laughs> to uh, authorities and to government, but all I can do really is put the onus on you <laughs> to have those conversations, and that's what I've done. So it seems a wee bit contrived. It's relating to indicator plates on the outside the high rise buildings. I would like to see that enshrined in legislation that that's a must for building owners, but I can't ask government to do that. I can only ask you to engage with government to do that, and that's what I've done. And the other one is around um, alarm systems within communal areas, uh, which sound when a fire occurs in a communal area of a high rise, which have resulted in people then evacuating on the back of Grenfell Tower, feeling that they want to get out of the building when actually it's, it's rubbish in a close, you know, and that just leads to further confusion for the firefighters attending. So again, I'm asking that the service engage with the local authorities that have taken that approach to try and figure out a better solution uh, moving forward. So it does feel a wee bit contrived. I apologise for that, but I didn't want to ignore it. And I, I obviously had to put the burden on you, sadly. <laughs> uh, we have two thematics ongoing, climate change uh, and it's very interesting to hear all of the, the work that's going on in regards to the uh, carbon neutrality and the responsibility around carbon uh, climate change. But what we're focusing on here is the op operational impact of climate change. We're talking here about increased weather related incidents, uh, wildfires, flood, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we've had some good engagement with the service and the SPOC for this thematic so far. There's been some field work carried out. There's further field work programmed, and um, we're in the next phase of that field work. Uh, and we still plan on producing this report by April of next year, if that is at all achievable. Um, one of the things we have experienced, and, and I'm sure it's not unique to our own inquiries, and it's a product of, in some part, the uh, pension remedy that was brought in. But when we're trying to identify subject matter experts, we're trying to identify those who have the experience and now have the remit for these types of activities. It's an ever-changing landscape. 
officers are moving and it's very difficult to pin down the right person with the right experience in the right post. I'm sure that's not unique to this part of your business, but it is uh, causing us some issues in, in identifying who we should be speaking to and who can answer our questions. So we'll continue to work with the service to try and improve on that. And the next one that we've just kicked off uh, last week actually is on mental health and wellbeing. So our, our inspection on this occasion is to consider the, um, the steps that the service has put in place to ensure it is adequately uh, protecting its staff in relation to mental health and wellbeing uh, issues. What we're really interested in here is how you're, because we have seen it, we've seen your policies, we've seen your strategies, there's a lot of good work done there, there's obviously a lot of partnership work done as well, but how that's manifesting itself at the fire station level is the bit, how that's impacting on the culture in a fire station in a watch, and are we really in a place where we are, you know, comfortable in saying that staff are comfortable to talk about their feelings and their um, needs at that local level and that fire station level. So I'm, I, I hope we are, but I really want to explore that part in, in great detail because what I'm seeing strategically looks great, but is that playing out at the end product? And, and, and that'll be the bit we'll be exploring in a lot more detail. So we hope that that report will be finished by March or April of next year. Uh, I have got some staffing issues that may cause that to be pushed back a little bit and I'll look into that in any detail today, but um, it does appear that that might be a wee bit challenging. But that's where we are. Uh, the relationship continues. It's hard to believe it's been 18 months since I've been in post, but I've certainly enjoyed creating those relationships, coming along to the meetings and seeing governance in action as a big part of that. So it's useful for me to be here today. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Robert. I, I mean, that's <coughs> comprehensive and, and feels like it's on the right topics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I mean, the only, the only point I wanted to make is that we, we have had some early discussions about risk and assurance, and you know we, we need to pick those up yeah. again if you're still okay Absolutely. To, to do that. Because I mean, what well, from this committee's perspective, if we if we can if we can take harder assurance from from any source, but particularly from from your good work, then then that would be great because. I think it's much less of an issue having looked at the reports that are being produced now compared to previous reports. It's much easier to understand, you know, what's been said, you know, how findings uh, support conclusions and how recommendations are kind of evidence based. Um, uh, it wasn't always like that. Uh, and, and if we can nudge that further along that dial, I think that's that's good for everyone. So no, I'm, I'm keen to pick up on that discussion, Brian, around the yeah. risk-based approach to get the fine future thematic. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm very keen to have that discussion. We just need to get some time in the diary. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks for that. Any any questions for, for Robert on, on this report? No? Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, and then that <coughs> takes us to a review of the actions. And again, I've seen you feverishly typing away, so I, I have some confidence that you can summarize them for us. Okay. <laughs> I don't let you down. I've, I've made, uh, very low standards. <laughs> um, I've made a number of points here, which if you could clarify, Chair, if you wish them to be actions or not, and you can you, you sit with. Um, the first one was in relation to, to Mary's point about uh, procurement processes to consider improving the link between community benefits and core procurement. So did I pick that up correctly? John's nodding too, John. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. John's. Ross is nodding too. Thanks. <laughs> I've got, got one in, I'm right, thank yeah. you. Um, second one was also for John um, to explore a GBA statement to demonstrate additional economic value. Yeah. I, I, I think there are broader benefits from that statement, oh, okay. from, in, including in our conversation, not to add to that, but including our conversations with the Scottish Government. Yeah, thanks. Next one was in relation to um, having a report through the internal audit process on how we deliver training now post COVID based on lessons learned. Okay, and that's, that's it. That's that's it. That's okay. <clears throat> um, consider extension of policy on income maximisation and commercialising IP incomes, exploring opportunities with subject matter experts such as universities. And I've got John and Rich. Okay. 
plan to finally um, consider bringing together all the action plans that we have in various departments and analysis of the change practices so as we don't revert into historical print. Yeah, and this is specific to COVID. COVID. Yeah. 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 Are you OK with that? <clears throat> Just <laughs> see, me. see me after, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the point. That's it. <laughs> 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 can, we, uh, can we stop hassling that new member of staff, please? It's his first meeting. <laughs> So that concludes, oh no it doesn't, sorry, uh, the forward plan uh, which is attached, um, any observations, suggested changes to that forward plan? No, good. Anything uh, ar arisen today which we feel needs to be taken forward to either the integrated governance forum or indeed the board strategy day? Stuff we've covered has been important already, agenda. So thanks very much for that. Our next meeting is the 17th of November, um, and brackets special. So it's a special meeting. So we'll get dressed up for that. Um, <laughs> so that's to consider the uh, annual report and accounts, mm -hmm. and we need that that meeting in order to go through that process to allow the board to approve them before the end of the calendar. Okay, if, if there's nothing further, that concludes the public session.